Lesson 7 for February 8 through 14 From the Lion's Den to the Angel's Den Read by Dr. Percy Harold Sabbath afternoon, February 8 Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there are examples in your word of behaviour that we could emulate. There are examples in your word of great faith. But we also thank you that from your word we can find faith for ourselves that will help us in our daily activities and in times when there is great stress placed upon us. We pray that as we open your word this week that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us. May we find in this story something that will be a blessing to us this week. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, for they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel 6 verse 4 again. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. After the Medo-Persians take over Babylon, Darius the Mede recognises the wisdom of Daniel and invites him to be part of the new government. The ageing prophet so excels at his public duties that the new king appoints him a chief administrator of the whole Medo-Persian government. However, as the chapter unfolds, Daniel faces the result of what could rightly be called the first sin, that of jealousy. Yet, before the story ends, we can see that Daniel is faithful, not only to his secular duties under the Medo-Persians, but most important to his God. And we can be sure that, to a great degree, his faithfulness to God directly impacts his faithfulness in these other areas as well. Daniel's experience with persecution serves as a paradigm for God's people in the time of the end. The story does not imply that God's people will be spared from trials and suffering. What it does guarantee is that in the conflict with evil, good will ultimately win out, and God ultimately will vindicate his people. Sunday, February 9. Jealous Souls Even in heaven, a perfect environment, Lucifer feels jealous of Christ. As Ellen White writes in The Story of Redemption, page 14, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ, yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, he bowed with them. But his heart was filled with envy and hatred. End of quote. Jealousy is such a dangerous feeling to harbour that in the Ten Commandments themselves, alongside the forbiddance of murder and theft, there is the command against covetousness, as we read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbour's. Question Read Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, along with Genesis thirty-seven eleven and 1 Samuel eighteen six to 9. What role does jealousy play in all these stories? Daniel 6, beginning at verse 1, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself among the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful, 
nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And Genesis chapter 37 verse 11, And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And First Samuel 18 verses 6 to 9, Now it had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced, and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Daniel's administrative abilities impressed the king but provoked the jealousy of other officers. Thus they conspired to get rid of him by accusing him of corruption. But as much as they search, they find no fault in Daniel's administration. They could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him, Daniel 6 verse 4. The Aramaic word translated as faithful also can be translated as trustworthy. Daniel is blameless. There is nothing the officers can do to raise an accusation against him. However, they also perceive how faithful Daniel is to his God, and how obedient he is to his God's law. So, They soon realize that in order to frame Daniel, they will have to produce a situation in which Daniel will be faced with the dilemma of obeying either God's law or the law of the empire. From what the officers have learned about Daniel, they are absolutely convinced that under the right conditions, he will side with his God's law over the empire's. What a testimony to Daniel's faithfulness. And so to finish today, What kind of struggles with jealousy have you had to deal with, and how have you dealt with them? Why is jealousy such a deadly and crippling spiritual fault? Monday, February 10. The Plot Against Daniel. Question. Read Daniel chapter 6, verses 6 to 9. What is the thinking behind this decree? How does it play on the king's vanity? Daniel 6, beginning at verse 6. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counsellors and advisers have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Darius may appear silly in promulgating a decree that he soon wishes to repeal. He falls into the trap laid by the officers, who are smart enough to play with the political circumstances of the recently established kingdom. Darius has decentralised the government and established 120 satraps in order to make the administration more efficient. However, such action entails some risks in the long run. An influential governor can easily foster a rebellion and split the kingdom. Thus, a law forcing everyone to petition only to the king for 30 days seems a good strategy to foster allegiance to the king and thus prevent any kind of sedition. But the officers mislead the king by claiming that such a proposal has the support of all the governors, administrators, satraps, councillors and advisers, an obvious inaccuracy. 
since Daniel is not included. In addition, the prospect of being treated as a god may have been appealing to the king. There is no evidence that Persian kings ever claimed divine status. Nevertheless, the decree may have been intended to make the king the sole representative of the gods for 30 days. That is, prayers to the gods have to be offered through him. Unfortunately, the the king does not investigate the motivations behind the proposal. Thus, he fails to perceive that the law that would allegedly prevent conspiracy was itself a conspiracy to hurt Daniel. Two aspects of this law deserve attention. First, the penalty for transgression is to be cast into the lion's den. Since this kind of punishment is not attested elsewhere, it may have been an ad hoc suggestion of Daniel's enemies. Ancient Near Eastern monarchs placed lions in cages in order to release them on certain occasions for hunting. So there was no shortage of lions to maul whoever dared to violate the king's decree. Second, the decree cannot be changed. The unchangeable nature of the law of the Medes and Persians also is mentioned in Esther chapter 1 verse 19, which reads... If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him, and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. And in Esther 8 verse 8, you yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet reigning. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Diodorus Siculus, an ancient Greek historian, mentioned an occasion when Darius III, not to be confused with the Darius mentioned in Daniel, changed his mind but could no longer repeal a death sentence he had passed on an innocent man. Tuesday, February 11, Daniel's Prayer Matthew 6, verse 6 reads, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Question, read Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Why doesn't Daniel simply pray quietly without anyone seeing him? Daniel 6 verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Daniel is an experienced statesman, but above all, he is God's servant. As such, he is the only member of the government who can understand what lies behind the king's decree. For Darius, the decree amounts to an opportunity to strengthen the unity of the kingdom, but for the conspirators, it is a strategy to get rid of Daniel. Of course, the real causes and motives behind the plot lie in the cosmic battle between God and the forces of evil. At this time, 539 BC, Daniel already had received the visions recorded in Daniel 7 in 553 BC and Daniel 8 in 551 BC. So he can understand the royal decree, not as a matter of mere human politics, but as an instance of this cosmic war. The vision of the Son of Man delivering the kingdom to the people of the Most High and the comforting assistance of the angel interpreter in Daniel 7 may have brought him the courage to face the crisis head on. He also may have reflected on the experience of his companions who have been brave enough to challenge the decree of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3. 
Thus, he does not change his devotional habits, but continues his customary practice of praying three times a day toward Jerusalem. In spite of the prohibition to make petition to any man or god but the king, Daniel takes no precaution to hide or disguise his prayer life during those critical thirty days also. He is an absolute minority, since he is the only one among dozens of governors and other officers on a collision course with the royal decree. Through his own prayer life, though, he demonstrates that the allegiance he owes to God comes before his allegiance to the king and his irrevocable decree. And so to finish the day. Read Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be Prince and Saviour, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Though the admonition here is clear, why must we, when acting in defiance of human law, always be sure that what we are doing is truly God's will? After all, think of people who died rather than betray a belief or belief system that we believe is wrong. Wednesday, February 12, In the Lion's Den Question, read Daniel chapter 6, verses 11 through 23. What does the king say to Daniel that reveals just how powerful a faithful witness Daniel is to God? Daniel 6, beginning at verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he laboured till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamented voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. 
Now the king was exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. The conspirators soon spot Daniel praying, that is, doing exactly what the decree has forbidden. And, as they bring the accusation before the king, they refer to Daniel in a demeaning way. That Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, in Daniel 6 verse 13. In their eyes, one of the chief officers of the empire, the king's favourite, is no more than a captive. In addition, they pit Daniel against the king by saying that Daniel does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed. Now the king realises he has been entrapped by signing the decree. The text says that he laboured till the going down of the sun to deliver him in verse 14. But there is nothing he can do to save the prophet from the prescribed punishment. The irrevocable law of the Medes and Persians must be applied to the letter. Thus the king, however reluctantly, issues the command to throw Daniel to the lions. But in doing so, Darius expressed some glimmering hope, which sounds like a prayer. Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. That's verse 16. The biblical text does not say what Daniel does among the lions, but one can assume he is praying, and God honours Daniel's faith by sending his angel to protect him. In the morning, Daniel remains unharmed and ready to resume his activities in the government. Commenting on this episode, Ellen G. White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 543 and 4, God does not prevent Daniel's enemies from casting him into the lion's den. He permitted evil angels and wicked men thus far to accomplish their purpose, but it was that he might make the deliverance of his servant more marked, and the defeat of the enemies of truth and righteousness more complete. And so to finish the day. Though this story has a happy ending, at least for Daniel, what about those accounts, even those in the Bible, for instance in Mark 6 verses 14 to 29, that don't end in deliverance here? How are we to understand them? So we'll finish with the story from Mark chapter 6 verses 14 to 29. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah, and others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for the nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced, and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciple heard of it, they came and took away his corpse, and laid it in a tomb.
Thursday, February 13, Vindication. Question. Read Daniel chapter 6, verses 24 to 28. What testimony does the king give about God? And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and steadfast for ever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. An important point of the narrative is the fact that Darius praises God and recognises God's sovereignty. This is a culmination, even a climax, of the praises of, or expressions of recognition offered to God in the previous chapters. Let's look at them in Daniel 2, verses 20 to 23. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons, he removes kings and raises up kings, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding, he reveals deep and secret things, he knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, you have given me wisdom and might, you have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. And Daniel 3, verses 28 and 29, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver them. And Daniel 4 verses 1 to 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs, and how mighty His wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is from generation to generation. And Daniel 4, verses 34 to 37. And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honour and splendour returned to me, my counsellors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down." Like Nebuchadnezzar, Darius responds to Daniel's deliverance by praising God. But he does more, too. He reverses his previous decree and commands everyone to fear before the God of Daniel in Daniel 6.26. Yes, Daniel is miraculously saved, his faithfulness rewarded, evil punished, and God's honour and power vindicated. But what we see here is a mini-example of what will happen on a universal scale. God's people delivered, evil punished, and the Lord vindicated before 
the cosmos. Question, read Daniel 6, 24. What might we find rather troublesome about this verse, and why? Daniel 6, beginning at verse 4. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them, and broke all their bones in pieces, before they ever came to the bottom of the den. There is, however, one disturbing problem, and that is the wives and the children, who, as far as we know, are innocent, and yet who suffer the same fate as the guilty ones. How can we explain what seems to be a mishandling of justice? First, we should note that the action is decided and implemented by the king according to Persian law, which includes the family in the punishment of the culprit. According to an ancient principle, the entire family bears responsibility for the offence of a family member. This doesn't mean that it's right. It means only that this story fits with what we know about Persian law. Second, we must note that the biblical narrative reports the event, but does not endorse the action of the king. In fact, the Bible clearly forbids that children be put to death because of the sins of the parents, as we read in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. So to finish the day, in the face of injustices such as this and so many others, what comfort can you get from such texts as 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5? What does it say and why is the point it makes so important? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5 Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Friday, February 14. Daniel's deliverance has been recorded in Hebrews 11. What can be called the Hall of Fame of Faith says that prophets, among other accomplishments, stopped the mouths of lions. That's Hebrews 11, verse 33. This is wonderful, but we should keep in mind that the hearers of faith are not only those who escape death, as Daniel does, but also those who suffer and die courageously, as Hebrews 11 also notes. God calls some to witness by living and others by dying. Thus the narrative of Daniel's deliverance does not imply that deliverance is granted to everyone, as we learn from the multitude of men and women who have been martyrs because of their faith in Jesus. However, the miraculous deliverance of Daniel does show that God rules, and he will eventually deliver all his children from the power of sin and death. This will become clear in the next chapters of Daniel. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Frenchman Jean-Paul Sartre once wrote that the best way to conceive of the fundamental project of human reality is to say that man is the being whose project is to be God. How does this help us to understand, at least on one level, why the king falls for the trap? Why must we all, in whatever our station in life, be careful of this same dangerous inclination, no matter how subtly it might come? What are other ways we might want to be like God? 2. What kind of witness do we present to others in regard to our faithfulness to God and to His law? Would people who know you think that you would stand for your faith, even if it cost you your job or even your life? 3. What do you see in Daniel that makes him a person that God can use effectively for his purposes? With the Lord's help, how can you develop more of the same characteristics? 4. 
In what ways could Daniel have been justified in deciding, in light of the decree, to have changed the way he prayed? Or would that have been a dangerous compromise? If so, why? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Praying Spanish Mother and it's by Rebecca Ruiz LaGuardia. As a ten-year-old girl, Pilar LaGuardia stared at the starry heavens over Spain and asked herself, Who created the stars? Do we have a creator? Or are we just the result of chance? This question filled her thoughts for years. She asked relatives for their opinions, but no one could provide a satisfying answer. She attended church services on Sundays, but the sermons about burning hellfire and a tyrannical and vengeful God caused her to drift away from her family's faith. An illness nearly killed her at the age of twenty, too. LaGuardia was terrified about dying without any answer to her question about God. One day, in anguish, she opened the window and screamed at the sky, God, if you exist, I want to know you. Help me. Answer me. God answered three days later when a Seventh-day Adventist church member, Simon Moncton, knocked at the door of her home. Moncton invited LaGuardia's father, an agnostic sheepkeeper, to evangelistic meetings, and he accepted out of curiosity. LaGuardia asked to go along, but he insisted on going alone. LaGuardia persisted and finally won the argument. LaGuardia, sick and weak, entered a Seventh-day Adventist church for the first time in the late 1960s. She heard beautiful hymns and the end-time prophecy of Daniel too. Although her father never returned after the first night, she attended until the end of the meetings. On the last night, she received a book as a gift, and a church member wrote down her address. Several days later, a woman visited her at home and offered Bible studies. Through the weekly studies, LaGuardia received answers to her questions about God. She found calm and peace for the first time. Pastor Louis Buineau baptized LaGuardia ten months after the Bible studies began. She married at 32, but it was difficult for her to conceive a child because of her health problems. Again, she went to God in prayer and became pregnant with me. My mother, pictured left, born in the humble home of a Spanish shepherd 73 years ago, is joyfully leading souls in the flock of the great shepherd today. I'm thankful to God for giving me such a mother. Rebecca Ruiz LaGuardia lives in Spain. Read about her missionary work in this quarter's Youth and Adult Mission Quarterly. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.